Thank you so much, Paul, and welcome everybody here to our fantastic session straight after lunch. And we're just here to let you know, really, that this is going to be a workshop. So in a moment, we're going to ask everybody to be up. And there's a whole heap of sticky notes down the back there and some pens because we really need your input today. So this is a conversation about some work that we've been doing. The Hill Country Futures Program is quite a big piece of work. It's not working. It's an $8.1 million program, which has been co-funded by Seedforce, PTG Rights, and MB, and Beef and Lamb. Beef and Lamb are running the program, and there are four really big streams of work in there. So the work that we're doing is an $8.1 million worth. It's been spread across a number of different streams of work. And it's really important because your voices in this work have been heard and listened to, and now it's time for us to start testing some of the things that we've found out. We've talked to people who live in the hill country, we've talked to policy makers, we've talked to people in government, in um, other sectors such as education, we've talked to pretty much everybody who is a stakeholder in the hill country future, but in the middle of it are farmers. And so we've spent a lot of time travelling around New Zealand. We've talked to 298 people, of that the bulk of them have been farmers, so your voices are well and truly alive in there. We've sat down with people and just listened, and those interviews that we've been having have been around about 90 minutes, and really have gone where people wanted to go with them. So if people wanted to talk about succession, or something that's fantastic and going on, or a sense of pride, your intergenerational farming, whatever it is that's been important to people, they've talked about it. And then at the end, we've had a questionnaire so that we've been able to capture some data at the back end of it, which is really similar as well. So from those interviews, we've got well over 250 hours worth of interviews. And as I said, we've talked to a wide range of stakeholders. So to understand our Pathways Framework, which is what we're here to talk to you about today, there's four really big key steps, and today we are going to be doing this piece here, which is a really big part of what we have to do. And again, this is where we need your voices in here. So from those interviews, we've come up with some concepts and we've created some stations around the walls, but we really need to make sure that are these on track? Are they realistic? Do they even make sense? Are there words in there that just don't make sense? Is there a better word? And is there anything in there that we're missing? So here's a couple of concepts that we've come up with, and they're down the back. There's one on the back wall there and one just down here on the side. And we really just want people to be having a talk. It might be that you have no feedback. It might be that you have lots of ideas. But we're going to be walking around and really sort of making sure that you have every opportunity to take part in what we're doing. The other thing I just really wanted to say is that so far the work that we've been doing has been creating a lot of interest and we've been presenting it to a number of really diverse audiences. 
And what we've really found is that when we've been acknowledging that what's happening out in the whole country is really complex, we've found lots of areas where people can agree. And so we've got lots and lots of connection with people who really want to keep working with us as we continue to try and figure out, well, what is it that we all really want for our whole country futures and in our communities? And it's been... <coughs> It's been a real privilege, really, as we've listened to people who have really opened their hearts. We've listened to people who've openly wept for 45 minutes as they've talked about their most harrowing stories, and we've talked to people who've absolutely beamed with pride when they talk about what they've achieved on their farms. So, um, are there any questions about what we're going to ask you to do? Futures is just meaning that there are many people in, in the Hill Country and that we've got many different takes on what the future might look like. So if we're working, if we've got people working in policy and in government and in industry good, they might have a slightly different take on what it's going to be. But we need to make sure that through those futures we're talking about all the different generations as well. So even in here we've noticed that we've got people from a number of different uh, parts of a generational journey in the room, and all of us have got a pathway we want to take. I'd just say that um, one of the challenges we've got with this work, one of the things we're trying to do is see if there is a common vision that all parts of the sector would want to join on. Is there a common walker that we can all jump on board? So I think Beef and Lamb does an excellent job of looking at the farmer voice. But we heard, um, I don't know if you were in a session, a couple of sessions earlier, when somebody who was a journalist said, nobody ever asked me my opinion. Well, we have asked journalists, we've asked policymakers, we've asked farmers, we've asked teachers that work in agricultural colleges, we've, tried, we've asked vets and farm advisors. We, so we have a sense of how much breadth there is in what people want to achieve in the hill country. We've kept that from you today, because obviously it would ruin the, <laughs> ruin the workshop. We know, and what we're interested to find out today is how much breadth is there in this room. What do you think? What's your vision for your future, the future of the next generations? Um, we heard this morning from the very first speech of the day that there is going to be change, and it's about creating um, the most of the opportunity that that change presents. And so that's what our work is about. It's about trying to see if it's possible to find a common shared vision that suits the whole sector. The next stage of our work is then saying, what would be the pathways to get to that vision? And how do those pathways different, differ for different people? You know, are they the same as farming up in Northland and down, I live right down in Otago? And are they, are they the same for people working in policy as they are on the farm? And how do we make those... Um Thank you. 
do they make them to do something that makes it make more sense? So any thoughts that you've got on them are all really, really valuable. Oh, okay. What? 
Oh, hello. Um, just to say, we've just had a great idea from someone over there who wants to get everybody to put up their ideal bumper sticker slogan, which I thought was a great idea. So if you've got a great idea for a bumper sticker slogan for the Hill Country, it's going on that wall over there.
Thanks, everybody. I can appreciate that workshopping is not everybody's natural world. And so thank you very much for um, the conversations that we've just had and all of the input in there. And already we can see that community means everything to everybody, that people and connectivity really does matter, that you really want to be able to remain profitable and stay doing what you're doing. So having the right to carry on and being whole country farmers is something that's very evident to to us already and I think the really cool and key point about this is that when we go further with this work we can start to talk about all of you and your voices so it's not necessarily Catherine and I sort of fabricating something out of the data it's, it's your voices but we thought there would be other bits in the research which you might find interesting as well and the first thing up there there's really no spoilers is that you know, your families, your land, your animals and your community really mean everything to you. So these were the, some of the really big key and lead, leading findings out of it. That native wildlife, biodiversity, natural resources and a healthy environment also means everything to everybody. And when we use words like biodiversity, it was really good to discover that the word biodiversity means hardly anything to not many people in here at all. But what we do know is that when you have got more freshwater crayfish in your creeks and more eels and more tui and more kereru, whatever it is, they increase, they really matter to you and there's an absolute sense of pride around that. And when you do work in native plantings and start to establish things that through the generations they're starting to grow, it really matters to you. That brings out an absolute sense of pride. What was concerning a lot of people, and it came up in every interview in the representative farmers that we talked to, was the rapid change of land use. And in particular, from farmland and whole scale farms into Pinus radiata. And so that was on a lot of people's radar. And so we've been very aware of that. We were also having a lot of talk around the increasing um, land use prices and the impact that that has on succession. And succession is one of those conversations that's incredibly complex because there are so many different scenarios which make succession easy and make succession hard. But 
it's been really interesting uh, how often succession came up and we've heard amazing stories and we've heard probably some of the toughest speak that we've ever had as families get ripped apart. The amount of regulation that's coming along is making people feel really uneasy because there's a real sense for not knowing when it's going to stop, how far it's going to go, how much impact it's going to have and what it's going to mean for me. Can I stay farming? Will it mean that I'm always going to have to be jumped? What does it mean? And so we're recognising that that's got a real impact on how much agency you feel like you've got or how much power you feel like you've got, how, how much can you do before the rules might come along and, and change that for you. And also people talked a lot about the, the media and public perception of farming. And we're sometimes really concerned but also really elated when there were lots of good news stories on there. And people talked about Country Calendar quite often actually because there's often a very environmental undertone to a lot of those stories. So really pleased that those sorts of messages are getting out there that people are really doing the right thing. And for anybody that was in here listening to Leanne's talk earlier, that was another thing that came out really loud and clear, was people really want their stories told. Not great big huge flash stories necessarily, but those stories just about over the last 20 years, 50 years, whatever it is, here's what we've been doing. This is what we're trying. We're working really hard. We've increased this and we've made this better because at the... At the absolute essence of everything was that everybody that we talked to really, really wanted to make sure that they could leave their farm in a better state for whoever the next generation was going to be. Are there any questions? Yeah. Just what are you going to do if there is no common theme though, people? Because you expect diversity, because people are different. One of the things that we've figured out really quickly is that at a really high level, there are lots and lots and lots of ways to describe the same thing. But when we've been able to reverse engineer right back into what the root of that is, then we've found that there are not, there's not that much diversity, but we've been able to put really good words around what really matters to people. Oh, sorry, the question was, that what are we going to do if we can't find one common theme amongst all of the people? So my uh, question was, have you uh, set out to put this sort of workshop together with a, maybe an urban-centric population? And the other part of my question would be, how have you found the variation between different regions in New Zealand uh, in terms of responses to your questions? Thank you. I think regionally there hasn't been a really big amount of diversity in terms of the really key messages. But when we talked to people, we, we called it a knowledge nest, we had farmers in the middle and as we got gradually more out they got uh, pretty much further away from a farm. So farmers in the middle and then I can't remember how it went, we had policy makers um, and influencers and policy and government right out on the edge. And what did change was just the expectation of how much change had to be made and how much speed we had to put around change. So people in the middle were saying actually we are changing but there are all sorts of things that we have to consider in order to make a change. So if you've got really high debt and there are a whole heap of jobs that you've got to do in terms of paying debt down and, and keeping on top of that, that was quite different to somebody who had paid off their mortgage, were mortgage free and able to invest more heavily quite often in planting natives and re-establishing some of those sorts of things, fencing and aesthetic work that they wanted to do. Um, so, um, okay, anyway, um, where's the benefit to us, let's say you find a vision, we buy into it, where's the benefit to us as farmers? I mean, heard a lot today about. Um, I heard a lot today about how there's um, sort of international pressures swirling around farming. There's national pressures. There's social license to operate. All of these things. There's an enormous amount of work going on in different quarters and different sectors on um, quality assurance programs. So we've heard of Taste Pure Nature. People have said, "Oh, we'd like a kind of benchmarking program, or we'd like a stamp." Um, the finance industry is leaning towards that. Internationally, supply chains, um, large wholesale food companies are leaning towards that. So everybody's sort of saying, 
um, a lot of a lot of companies, a lot of international supply chain, um, large wholesale food producers or food consumers, are using the word regenerative agriculture, not really knowing what that means. Um, so if we want to put forward the the case for New Zealand farming, New Zealand, you know, the New Zealand story, we need to know a really, we need to be able to say a really strong story before a story is put onto us, if you like. So that's, I suppose, where I'm thinking about it. What, what if, if people are going to be saying, um, setting expectations for what they want to buy, can we say, well, this is what we want to have in that, right, these are the expectations we would want to meet. Um, this, this is a fair, this is only a very small part of that conversation. You know, this is research is tiny bricks that come together to build a building. This is one small brick, even though it's quite a large research program. And I think, um, I mean, I've heard so many good things today of other people doing, you know, whole walls where we're hitting a little brick. But I think it's the conversations that we have, the workshops, the, the interviews, are as much a part of our research as the vision itself. It's as much about as um, starting the conversations. And I think, you know, taking the conversations to the urban setting, having conversations across sectors, getting people together to talk who wouldn't normally talk, that's a big part of the work that we do. Um, whether we get to a final vision or not, who knows? It, the, the conversations along the way are probably more important than that end result. So does taste pure nature you No, taste pure nature is, is separate to us. We're an independent research program. So what we are, the results that we find may feed into the taste nature, pure nature program, but we've tried our hardest to sort of be blinking it away because I think it's too easy to become part of an echo chamber. So we've tried very hard to, to go with an open mind, start from a blank slate, and we have come. To, to have findings and create a vision that's very similar to the beef and lamb vision, to the taste, nature vision, that's great news. That's a good news story. It means everybody is sort of on the same page, but that wasn't necessarily our expectation. Just, is it a quick one? Yeah. 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 Yep, uh, good point. And some of the talks that we have given have focused on how people have been incredibly diverse and how they've been generating income, and it's been really useful to us as well. And it's also a big part of not just resources, but and also our connectivity. For instance, I live 75 k's away from our nearest office, so connectivity makes it <laughs> basically makes it possible for me to work where I do. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ange. Thanks, Catherine. So, look, I just got a couple of small gifts here and appreciation of your talk. So, and team doing a bit of work, sure you don't be really cool. So, I'd just like the team to show their appreciation. Thank you, everybody.